This week, the Cocktail Investing Podcast is coming to you from the Inside ETF Conference. ETFs, Bitcoin, and man, my feet are sore. All that and much more coming up. All right, all right, all right. It is time once again for another episode of Cocktail Investing, the podcast where we do our best to distill all the everyday everyday noise around you into clear investing signals. And believe me, this week, when we were at the Inside ETF Conference 2018 down in Hollywood, Florida, there was a lot of noise going on about all the latest happenings in uh, ETFs, quite a bit on Bitcoin and so much more. I'm Chris Versace, uh, Tomatica Research's Chief Investment Officer, and joining me as always is Lenore Hawkins, Chief Macro Strategist. That's right. So before we get into the conference and uh, an extra special episode, we've got some interviews we want to share with you. Um, I just want to remind everybody to go to the TomaticaResearch.com website, check out all our wares, our subscription products, our free e-letters that can bring you up to speed on what's going on in the market and what to uh, look at in the week ahead. That would be the weekly wrap and the Monday morning kickoff. And you can also see past episodes of the podcast as well. So with that housekeeping uh, stuff out of the way, Lenore, I got to ask, you know, your first time at Inside ETF, what did you think? I thought it was really interesting how much talk there was about Bitcoin and blockchain, despite the fact that there's very little ETF exposure um, possible there for individual investors. Um, I thought it was really interesting to hear how people were really concerned with keeping the industry innovating, innovating so that it's not just kind of plain vanilla indexes, that there's more and more interest in more creative indexes. And um, we'll probably be talking about that in our next podcast. Yeah. Uh, and I also was really surprised how many conversations can get started based on just a pair of shoes. <laughs> well, that's because you wore probably the coolest pair of shoes that anybody had seen in a long, long time. But the, <laughs> uh, you know, as, as I know, that's, you know, that's just standard business operating uh, procedure for you with your Jimmy shoes. I know that. But I, but, I, I think this means that they should be like a business expense, right? Uh, it's a I, <laughs> yeah, you know, I, I, I'm just going to say, I don't know how many people at the IRS happen to listen to this podcast, so I would just kind of keep that to yourself. Just kidding, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> but, but you know, I, I think you are right about um, the the continued innovation that we're seeing in uh investment strategies when it comes to ETF. And it's funny because when we were at the conference, you know, I, I have to be honest, I didn't realize this, but it was the 25th anniversary of the spiders, which is of course the, the index and the ETF that mirror the S and P 500. And I, I think we're going to see um, over the next several years, a lot more innovation in ETFs as new strategies are coming about, not as you pointed out, not just mimicking the market indices. And, you know, we are seeing, uh, more ETFs go to active management rather than, than just passive. And again, following, you know, for the, uh, the majority of the uh, major market indices, uh, looks like we're going to start seeing some long short strategies. It'd be interesting to see how that impacts on hedge funds. And there, there's other ones too. And, you know, one of the conversations we're having today on the podcast is with the folks um, behind the buzz U.S. sentiment leaders ETF, ETF, excuse me, uh, ticker symbol BUZ that leverages artificial intelligence to assess investor sentiment for individual securities across the digital landscape. So, and, and as I learned, that's just not, you know, Instagram and Twitter, but they are scraping data across the entire um, internet, particularly wherever, you know, individuals or end businesses are talking about stocks and sharing their opinions if they're getting more bullish, less bullish. It, it's really kind of an interesting thing, I think. Um, but Lenore, any, any other um, thoughts before we not only talk with Jamie Wise at Periscope Capital, but also Doug Jonas, uh, who's the head of exchange traded products at the New York Stock Exchange? I, I think the other thing that was, was interesting was just hearing um, people talk about how much the conference, because it is the, the big one for the ETF industry, just how much that conference has grown over the past, like I think it's 12 years now. Yeah, I, I think you're absolutely right. I mean, I, we were talking with some folks at uh, one ETF issuer that were saying, I remember when this conference used to be, you know, 300, 400 people eight, nine years ago. And I think at one point we were told that there were over 2,500 people that were registered to attend the conference. So it's it's mushroom. But, but when I think back about, you know, the asset size for ETFs and how they've exploded taking share from mutual funds and, you know, to some extent, individual stocks. I'm not that surprised, you know, 
a anytime we see a huge move like that, you know, it's bound to attract new entrants. And we're, we saw quite a bit of those as well. Yep. And it looks like it's only going to get bigger. I totally agree. Totally agree. All right. Well, let's let's um, get to our interviews. First up is uh, Doug Jonas, uh, head of exchange traded products at the New York Stock Exchange. And we talked with Doug about what is driving the ETF market, why we are seeing new product strategies and why ETFs should continue to see even more inflows. Here we go with Doug Jonas. So we're here with Doug Jones, Stock Exchange, NYSE ICE. Doug, thanks for joining us. Yep, it's Jonas. Jonas? Yeah. Did I did I botch that? That's okay. Yeah, you know, I get it all the time. For Sace, Versace, who are you? Are you related? So I, apo I, I apologize, but I feel your pain. No need. You should see my Starbucks name. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, Doug, we're, we're sitting here at Inside ETF, and it's kind of a fascinating uh, year for ETFs. 25th anniversary SPY. We've seen a lot of money over the last several quarters come into ETFs. ETFs. What, from your perspective, being the guy, head of listings at the NYSE ICE, what, what is driving all of this? Yeah, I mean, the, the reality is the, the not only has it been a booming year last year, but going into 2018, we're looking at the exact same thing, if not amplified. Okay. Uh, we'll, we'll come out of January with probably more listings in a single month than we've seen uh, for most of the history of the ETF market. And to me, that's an example of the benefits of ETFs that I think we all talk about so much, right? The, the look, they tend to be lower cost. They tend to be much more tax efficient, mm -hmm. right? We all have execution distribution ease, right? We can add them to any portfolio at any time. So all these different benefits that combine, investors continue to, to gravitate towards them. We see that through individual investors, DIY, the advisor market, and of course institutions. But now we're touching even new, new, new asset classes. Uh, in the last month, we've launched 15 new commodity ETFs. So, so let, let, let me just back you up. Yeah. So, you know, I, I, there was a presentation earlier today where they're talking about the vast majority of ETFs are large cap equities. Mm -hmm. So you're talking about pivoting out of that into other strategies. Yeah, that's right. I mean, uh, you know, the headline news is, though, the biggest uh, ETFs get bigger. Right. But if we look across our lineup, almost every day we have new issuers getting uh, to a billion dollars in assets under management. The, the growth that's happening at the small and mid-sized firm is happening very, very quickly, and it's, it's, it's not because they're launching that broad-based, low-cost beta large cap, right? It's because they're entering new spaces, they're finding, you know, I've heard this term at the conference this week, uh, active 2.0. Right, yeah, yeah, we've heard that. Yeah, and, and you know, maybe we're going to move away from the term smart beta, but the reality is a lot of these active strategies that are consistent, executable, repeatable, are now forming into indexes. Right. And then we are wrapping ETFs around those indexes, so we're effectively taking active management and we're putting it into this ETF wrapper. So it doesn't sound like you see any slowdown in the ETF explosion. If anything else, it's a new wave of ETFs. Yeah, I think the growth is, will continue and the growth has been there um, for, for numerous reasons. We talked about the benefits, but I think what we're going to see next is you know, we, we saw it happen in, in the passive space. Now we're starting to enter this this, this active, active space. space. And you know, we're seeing either active strategies themselves come in just wholly as an actively managed ETF, mm -hmm. but more importantly, as we said, this sort of smart way of taking indexing and making them active. So so for the listener, Doug, you know, we, we traffic in these terms all you know, all day, every day just like you do, but yeah. from the listener's perspective, what's the difference between active and passive? Right, that's a good, great question, right? So so an active man an actively managed ETF or an actively managed fund, there's a portfolio manager that's that's sitting there and saying, I'm going to buy this stock and sell this one or not buy that one and they're making that active decision. So it's like an actively managed portfolio. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. Versus an index, uh, you know, the the index itself is saying here are the stocks or bonds that are in the index and therefore if I'm tracking it, those are the stocks or bonds that I'm going to own. Mm -hmm. Now, historically that was funds like S&P 500, you mentioned the 25th anniversary right of SPY. We we all kind of get that index. It's a headline index, it's yep. on the TV. It's the top 500 companies, they're market cap weighted, and then they're owned in that proportion. It's very straightforward. Now, this, this smart indexing, right, smart beta is right. saying, how do we take an active manager's process, the process that that fund manager or that fund management team is using on a daily basis to pick which stocks to own, okay. and how do we take that really smart and intelligent process and build it into an index that acts 
more active okay. that acts like the portfolio manager. So, so to date, the vast majority of ETFs have been passive in nature. What, why is active now coming into the forefront? Well, I think the, the reality, right, is a lot of us are looking at the market valuations and we're saying, okay, it may, you know, we're at all-time highs every day. Uh, it, maybe it worked really well in, you know, historically just to own the whole market. Right. But as an advisor of, of new money coming into the market, how do I make a fiduciary responsibility and look for the best pockets of opportunity with, and also maybe provides myself with some downside risk, maybe also recognize that, you know, maybe the entire market isn't what I want to own anymore. Right, right. I mean, it's been a fantastic bull market. We're, you know, uh, January 2018, we dial it all back to 29. It's been a huge run, but we're getting a little long in the business cycle. The Fed isn't raising rates. There's some other concerns out there. It sounds like it might be time for new strategies, maybe even some hedging strategies. Yeah, and also, you know, there, no one says that the advisor market is just selling out all their passive and going into active or smart beta. And it's, it's, it's the other. It's they're combining them, right? So they'll, they'll take a, a slice of their portfolio and say, hey, this makes sense where I want low-cost beta, but I also want to add some intelligence to this portfolio and maybe do some overlays, and that could be done either at a factor level or at a theme level, obviously. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, and and so it's a great way that, and it, you know, we always call it the advisor as alpha. Right. It's what is the advisor adding to the portfolio that's that's building some alpha generation in for the client, and a lot of times it's that choice of which product to use. So we hear about a lot of you know educational needs, right? But I, I also think too, if we step back, there's something like two thousand ETFs now, right? Something well like over. That. Well, yeah. well over well two thousand. Yeah. So so if you're an individual or an RIA, how do you decide amongst the sea of ETFs? Yeah, I, it, and it's tough, and I feel for the advisor because it comes down to that due diligence. Uh, historically, it was, it was probably not a lot of due diligence, right? They probably said, well, it's the only one in this category. <laughs> right, right. Well, I, I think the one that everybody talks about is Hack is a great example about that. First pure play cybersecurity, maybe everybody should have some cybersecurity, something like that. Right, and now you've got a, a number of different cybersecurity. Right. Uh, this week is a great example. We launched uh, two different blockchain ETFs. One's active, one's passive. Uh, so now, you, as an advisor, you have to say, okay, well, if I believe in the potential growth opportunities of blockchain and I want to add that to my portfolio, you have to make a decision. Do you want to go with an active manager that's actually making decisions, or do you want to go with an index that, that is going to just passively decide whether it owns a stock or doesn't own a stock? Right, right. And so that, that's a great example of there is no one-size-fits-all. You might think of yourself as traditionally, I just like index, it, it's... It works itself. I don't have to make an active decision. But now, all of a sudden, you're thinking blockchain. Maybe I want a portfolio yeah, yeah. manager that's watching the market and looking for developments, making my decisions for me. Well, you know, I like that whole blockchain angle. It's something that we're looking at. But it, it's fascinating to me because, like with one of our other themes, aging the population, people are living longer and they're undersaved. It says to me that they're going to continue to need growth assets in their portfolio. This sounds like a fascinating idea that maybe three, four years ago you wouldn't have seen in an ETF. Yeah, that's exactly right. I mean, we look at the demographic shift and the demographic changes like you talk about, right. and that, that's a real economic impact and a real effect that's going to happen. And so those are the types of products that are now coming to market to say, hey, how do we take advantage of this as an investor, not just as a consumer? Right. Let, let's look at global trends. Let's look at what's happening. And then let's build products around it that, that are intelligent and allow for a portfolio to get some alpha and take advantage of the economic impact of this this particular change. Yeah, I think we were talking uh, last night, and you were saying that there was a, you know, I asked you, like, what, what what's your wish list of products out there? And you said something along the lines of India, if I remember correctly. Yeah, I mean, we look at, um, at, at the different products that are coming to market. Uh, I'll, give you, I'll give you an example. You know, historically, we've just looked at emerging markets. And, and a lot of times, advisors would just say, okay, this, this percent of my portfolio is, is emerging, and that's it. It was just one product. Maybe it was just broad MSCI emerging. Done. But but it's 2018, right? We have right. access to more information. Oh, more data. More data. And now we're looking for better intelligence. And so now you're starting to see things like, uh, you know, uh, fintech or internet commerce in emerging markets. Right. You're seeing, uh, like, Crane Shares launch their cars ETF around automation in the automotive industry. So, you know, intelligence around what's happening versus just... Owning the whole slice. Now, is an advisor selling all of emerging to buy that? No, they're going to hold part of their broad MSCI right, emerging right. or FTSE emerging, and then they're going to add in these other intelligence slices to take advantage of a demographic shift. So, as these new wave of ETFs become uh, more focused, 
right? Is it possible that over time you think maybe the need for people or the desire for people, more importantly, to own individual stocks continues to fall because they can yet they have even more choices across the ETF landscape? You know, that that's one of the prognosticator right. statements that we see in here. I, it's hard for me to believe that. I, you know, we've always had mutual funds, right? Mutual funds have been around for a very long time. There's a lot of money invested in mutual yep. funds. There's still plenty of people out there that are stock picking and still a lot of active managers that are stock picking. It might be the wrapper changes, right? Mm-hmm. And instead of owning a mutual fund wrapper, we own an ETF wrapper. Or instead of owning a SMA, we own an ETF wrapper. But at the end of the day, if, it, if it's an active portfolio or it's an active index, there, there is still someone picking stocks. Okay. Well, I got one. There. I got yeah. one. I got one last question for you. So you just because you brought up mutual funds, and I think a lot of people have recognized that ETFs have been kind of taking market share from mutual funds. But despite the huge run up in ETF assets, ETFs are still a relatively small component of the overall mutual fund business. Right. Very small component. That's right. That's right. You know, it's it's uh, it, it, it's one of those things. People look at the headline and say, "Oh my gosh, ETFs are taking over the world." They're certainly growing. Right. We have a very large market, but. Uh, you know the, the ETF market is, is somewhere around that three and a half to four trillion number. Uh, a- actively managed ETFs, or uh, excuse me, actively managed funds alone industry is closer to that fifteen to seventeen trillion number. So, you know, when you add up the entire marketplace, ETFs are still a very small subset. Okay, and I, I'd be remiss if I didn't kind of plug you guys or let you plug yourself on this, Doug. What, what is the role of uh, the New York Stock Exchange in the ETF industry? Because I understand you might have a Kind of a little bit of market share to talk about. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, eighty-three uh, percent of the industry lists and trades on the New York Stock Exchange, which is great. Uh, we we appreciate. We're humbled by that number, but the the role of the exchanges is to facilitate liquidity, right? Our at, at our very heart, it comes down to provide the best possible markets for an ETF to trade. Which you know, if you're the whether you're the investor, right, and we can reduce the overall cost of your transaction, that's great. It puts more return in your portfolio. If you're an issuer, then we're looking for how do we build the best marketplace for you so that you can draw the most buyers and sellers. It doesn't matter what you're what what you're doing. If a mar- if a marketplace is healthy with a lot of buyers and sellers, you're going to have the best price discovery and the lowest transaction costs. That that's our role. Okay, so Doug, you've been uh, thanks for coming on. I know the Inside ETF is crazy, uh, but before we get out of here, was there anything that we you want to talk about that we didn't bring up? Well, if anyone missed the news, we, we announced yesterday uh, we've licensed some IP that the New York Stock Exchange has owned for quite some time around a periodically disclosed active ETF solution. So if you're an active fund manager and you've, you've wanted to be in the ETF space, but you just don't want to disclose your portfolio every day, uh, this is uh, hopefully a solution to do that. We filed with the SEC exemptive relief with, uh, with our partners at Natixis. And so we're working with them on that first filing, uh, but we, we're excited and, and we'd love to work with other active managers out there that are interested. Just just come see us and talk to us. And, and what's the best way for these people to get in touch with you, Doug? It, they can either uh, come directly to the to the website, nyse.com, ETF, and, uh, or they can, they can email us at ETFs at nyse.com. Great. Thanks a lot, Doug. Thank you for having me. Okay, that was our conversation with Doug Jonas. Again, head of uh, exchange traded products over the New York Stock Exchange. Great conversation. Doug is a great guy, and I I love talking to him whenever I can. Uh, And now we're going to shift gears, and we're going to talk with Jamie Wise at Periscope Capital about the U.S. Sentiment Leaders ETF, ticker symbol BUZ. Hey, Jamie. Thanks for joining me today on Cocktail Investing. Great to be here. Thanks so much for having me. Uh, ha- happy to do it. Happy to make some time for you at Inside ETF 2018, where everybody's you know caucus together. But Jamie, you know we have uh, I think we've known each other for about a year or so now, and I, I always found what you were doing extremely fascinating. Uh, I kind of boil it down maybe a little too simple okay. to thinking that you're measuring social sentiment and uh, tying that into stocks that investors are interested in figuring out a way to uh, invest on that. Sure. Is that is that the right way, or is there a little more to it? There's than a little that? more to it than that. There always is a little right, bit more right. to it. Um, Basically, we really became interested in identifying and discovering, can we measure sentiment at the stock level? And that's something new Mm -hmm. based on this huge amount of online content. And social is a big part of that, but really we're looking beyond social. It's not just social platforms, it's news articles, it's anywhere people are talking about stocks, blogs, forums, comment sections, to really understand for the first time at the stock level, what do people feel about stocks from an investment perspective as opposed to using a proxy. So in other words, you're kind of measuring in some proprietary manner if they are um, getting more bullish, less bullish, bearish, is that is that what you're talking about? Yeah, we're trying to observe 
changes in trends of sentiment over longer time periods. So this isn't trying about trying to figure out where is that stock going to trade in the next minute or the next hour. We look at sentiment from a longer term perspective. So you're investing, you're not trading per That's se. exactly, what are you doing this for me? That's yes. exactly right. This is an investment <laughs> strategy. It's a theme. And the idea being, if you can identify the stocks that have the greatest amount of conversation, consistent conversation, right. then when you see a change in the sentiment of that conversation, you can have a high amount of confidence that it's actually representative of the entire investment community and therefore predictive. So I'm just curious, when you talk about a change in sentiment, can you give an example of you know of words or, or uh, something else that you're seeing that goes from either good to bad or bad to good? Yeah, so we're really, you know, we're analyzing millions and millions of data points every single day. So the, the community and the amount of data out there is huge. The big advancement in sentiment analysis really shifted about a decade ago. So 10 years ago, we would have just looked to keyword analysis, right. or used sort of a dictionary approach, mm -hmm. and then you would map certain words as being either positive or negative. Right. That doesn't really work well when you apply it to the way people talk about stocks. We, or, or on Twitter. Or on Twitter, right? Because <laughs> yeah. we talk about stocks using language that's very different than we talk about when we're doing you know, a, a recent restaurant that we went right. to, or a vacation, right. or a product that we bought. There's certain language, and phrases, and acronyms, and all of those things are mm -hmm. different. So it doesn't map nicely from a dictionary. What the advantages of artificial intelligence and neural networks allow us to do today is really label conversational text in its entirety. So models can learn by experience the same way you or I can read a sentence and know if it's positive or negative so, without having to focus in on a keyword. So, so your algorithms have just continued to get better over time as you mine more data from these various digital platforms. Absolutely. The more labeled data and the more experience you can give your model, the more accurate it can be in and labeling sentiment correctly. That's okay. very important. So, I, so now that we have an understanding of how you do what you do, can you give us some examples of where you've either been caught off guard or seen some very confirming signals, yeah. even though a... Um, a stock might be tanking, but you're getting overly bullish confirmation. Yeah, and that's a that's a, a great segue, actually, because there's really two reasons why people talk positively about a stock. Either it's trending positively, and people expect that trend to continue, so it's sort of like a price momentum story that people like to see, or it's becoming a value name, so it's fallen too far, and people expect it to revert back now. So mm -hmm. it's a value stock, it's trading at a low multiple, those types of names. Um, on the trending side, we certainly see some interesting things around the chip makers. Hey everybody, we're back, sorry about that. We were outside by the pool talking with Jamie and it just got too noisy, all that happy hour music. But good news is we found a quieter spot. We're back with Jamie. And Jamie, you were just telling me something about um, some sentiment analysis and measurement that you were doing regarding chip stocks. Why don't we right. pick up there? Absolutely. So the chip makers, uh, the chip stocks are actually something that's a really interesting case study for Buzz because we all know that these stocks have really been on a, an incredible tear. And how do we validate that as investors? And how do we decide to stay long or not? Have they run too far? What we use is sentiment as a yardstick to measure that against. And what we have seen consistently over the past year is that sentiment remains notably strong. Even in the face of any negative headline or potential downgrade of a stock, it's run too far, the online community is unanimous in their opinion that these chip makers really have room to grow and should be included in the portfolio, and the performance has certainly not surprised us given the strong sentiment. So ju just to quickly recap, you're, you're kind of measuring the first and second derivative change to st strap my math hat on, if you will, mm -hmm. and coming up uh, using an algorithm to determine whether investors are getting bearish or bullish on a name. That's right. That's exactly right. So think of it as almost a wave building in the ocean. If, if a normal stock has a consistent amount of conversation, it's got that normal ebb and flow to it, just like an ocean current. Right. What we're looking for is a wave building in that ocean. Okay. And if that wave starts, it gathers momentum, and it will carry forward for some period of time. Okay. And Jamie, you just said that it has to have enough consistent conversation. So does that mean, I mean, we hear a lot about Apple, Facebook, Google, all those different names, but for, you know, well-traded, tra well large-cap, mega-cap names, but for smaller names, small-cap, maybe micro-cap names, is it a little tougher to get a signal? Yeah, and we don't even look at those names for a couple of reasons. We only focus on stocks that have a market cap of $5 billion or higher and that are consistently talked about. For the micro-cap and thinly traded names, absolutely, it doesn't make sense. And if a name doesn't have enough consistent conversation, regardless of the sentiment, then 
and you really don't get confidence in its predictive nature. So from a statistical point of view, if you want to put your math hat on, you get a, high, a much higher st statistical significance if you have 50,000 people talking about stock every single day, regardless of the news events, just talking about it as part of their normal course dialogue and conversation, than if you have you know 50 people that just talk about a stock because it had some kind of news release. Yeah, it, it's almost kind of like, you know, I remember those Yahoo message boards that could be, you know, people could post something, you could see a stock explode. It's a lot of noise. It's not a signal per se. That's right. right? Yeah, and what we're looking for is a signal to validate the, the the idea that's really being talked a lot about in academia, but never could really be proven in the past, is that sentiment should be predictive. It right. just needs to be measured right, and it needs to have the right sort of audience. You need a very diverse audience. You need independence of opinion. You need a, an incentive for truth-telling with really online platforms provide because people want to engage, they want feedback, they're looking for that validation, so they have that incentive to tell the truth about what trades they're making in their portfolios. So just a quick question that popped into my mind. I'm sure you guys analyze Facebook, what's being chatted on Facebook, yes? Uh, yeah, it is part of the source list. Okay, so as they change their feeds and you know they're going to reposition published articles for more family friend articles the original way people got onto Facebook to connect with people mm -hmm. is that going to have any impact on what you guys are doing or, or conversely if Google changes their algorithms does that yeah, affect well, you guys at all? The type of analysis and the type of data points that we're looking at are less news data points and more interactive data points, right? Because, and think about it, news articles typically don't have high amounts of sentiment in it. People are reporting facts about a company. What's very... We would hope. We hope. We hope. <laughs> we hope they're true facts, at least. But nevertheless, it's less about the article, but more importantly about the engagement that it drives in the community. So if you look at the end of a, you know, an article in the New York Times, there'll be a bunch of comments, comments. after that. It's the comments that matter to us. And uh, you think about an influencer like Carl Icahn or even Donald Trump, he talks about a stock. It's not so much what he says specifically. It's the reaction. Yeah, it's, it's the, the reaction. reaction. He's okay. a catalyst for conversation, and that's what's exciting for us because we care about what the community thinks, not any one specific influencer. Okay, so you're, you're tracking all this, again, to gauge whether you think a stock is becoming more attractive to the investment community, less attractive. Are there any other uses for this data? You know, from, you know, we, I know just from being an investor myself that time to time stocks tend to move and all of a sudden, there could be a takeout announcement, there could be a merger announcement, something like that. Is there anything like that you guys are able to tap into? We see that specifically in the biotech arena. We haven't really seen it across other sectors, but just this week, Juno was a new name for the Buzz Index, and lo and behold, three days later, it was taken over. Okay, now, hang on one second. So, we're talking, we've been talking about your methodology, and you just said the Buzz Index. So yes. We'll just, so, let's, let, let's back up. What is this Buzz Index you're telling me about? Right, so this all started as a research project project from the hedge fund that I run called Periscope Capital. This is over five years ago. What we decided to do when we really saw that there were some insights to be had from sentiment is we created an index. And that index looks for a couple of things. It starts with large cap U.S. equities and then the most talked about large cap U.S. equities and then it ranks them based on their relative sentiment strength. So the index, which is rebalanced monthly, holds the 75 stocks with the most bullish readings. Okay. So if there's an index, knowing you know that we here at Tomatica we're thematically based and we're noodling on some different things. My question to you is, a lot of ETFs and other exchange traded products are supported by indices. Has that happened with the Buzz Index? Yes, the Buzz is actually tracked by an ETF. So, there, so, so is there Buzz about Buzz? There is some Buzz about Buzz, but not enough to get it in the index just yet. Okay. Um, but and also, I should know we only focus on single stock conversations. We don't co we don't focus on conversations around ETFs or other indices. Okay. This is a basket of stocks. Uh, but the ETF launched back in April 2016 under the ticker symbol BUZ, and so it is AI with a track record. That's fantastic. Now you, you just said only stocks at some point as the ETF market continues to grow might there be some other index that you develop? We are just at the beginning stages of what we can do here. It's not just stocks on the long side. We can think about stocks from the negative sentiment and the short side. And there's huge amounts of conversation in the macro arena. So we're talking about rates and commodities, currencies, lots of discussion, lots of data to pull from there. Right now our focus is large cap U.S. equities, 
but I expect that'll grow over time. Well, I think when you figure out how to uh, track the sentiment on interest rates, the Fed might be interested in what you're seeing. Yes, because it's less about, again, what the Fed says, but what the community reaction to that, right? right? Because it, that's what's driving the price. The, react, the reaction to the expectation. Exactly right. Absolutely. Well, Jamie, anything else before we get out of here? Hey, well, just thanks so much for having me. It's really great. If you want more information about our index, you can go to buzzindexes.com or the ETF has their own website, buzzetfs.com. And are you on Twitter, Jamie, or of any course. other social platform? Buzz Indexes, on Twitter, across social, find us there. Perfect. Hey, Jamie, thanks a lot. Okay, great being here. Thank you. You know, I have to say, I really enjoyed speaking with Jamie. Um, you know, that is such a differentiated product, and I'm really kind of anxious to see how um, how it not only continues to uh, track sentiment, but also as they look to expand to other products, not just going, you know, bull signals or bullish signals on individual stocks, but also potential short signals. And if they migrate into other asset classes, I, I really think that's a kind of a, a very differentiated product, very differentiated strategy. And so kind of with that, we've got the end of this week's podcast. And, and Lenore, I think you were saying that we're going to be back next week with even, you know, I guess maybe deeper or maybe our thoughts on uh, ETF, uh, I'm sorry, on Insight yeah. ETF. There was a, it was interesting to seeing um, the ETF industry more from the inside of the businesses rather than being a user of an ETF, getting to see all of the producers of these ETFs interacting with each other and looking how they view their business. And I think that would be helpful for people to hear about next week. I, I totally agree. So that's, and, you know, I, I think rather than uh, try and sandwich it in, I think we're making the right move by, uh, trying to have a full show dedicated to that. Plus, let's be honest, Lenore, that was a long conference and we're tired. Oh my God, my feet hurt. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe next time you wear more comfortable shoes. Nah, probably not. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, everybody. We will, see, yeah, we will see you next week. 